Fellow members, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Michael Lang. I am the chairman of the Hong Kong IE Transitions Committee. Welcome to the public lecture of the Hong Kong IE Outstanding Paper Award for Young Engineers and Researchers 2021 and 2022. It is such a delight to have your presence at this event. The Hong Kong IE Outstanding Paper Award for Young Engineers and Researchers was first launched in 2006. It aims to encourage young engineers and researchers to develop innovations and technologies, publish their achievements, as well as promote engineering profession among the younger generation. The competition is open to young engineers and researchers age 35 or below worldwide. Last year, the public lecture was canceled due to the prevailing pandemic. This year, we are delighted to have the paper awardees for both 2021 and 2022 coming together to share with us their winning papers and research accomplishments. Now, may I introduce our first awardee, Dr. Ju Hua He is the first author of the award paper for 2021. Dr. He received his PhD in civil engineering from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology in 2020. He will present his award paper on potential and prospects of photocatalytic disinfection using sustainable solar energy driven <coughs> photocatalyst. Without further ado, let's welcome Dr. He. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, everyone. And uh, good evening. Thank Thanks Hong Kong IE and the Hong Kong IE Transaction from the award and the opportunity of giving this public lecture. I'm Ju Hua He, now the research fellow of Foshan University and for the former research associate of HKUST. This evening, I would like to give a lecture entitled Potential and Prospects of Photocatalytic Disinfection Using Sustainable solar energy driven photocatalyst. Before that, I would like to introduce our uh, authors of this work. This is me, and it is glad to have IR Kenny Hoy from DSD and the Professor Irene Lowe to join this work. Here's the outline of this lecture. There were four parts. First, the background to introduce the photocatalytic disinfection and the, the, develop, the development of the titanium dioxide based photocatalyst, and then the methodology and the results of this, of this work. And finally, the conclusion to show the potential and prospects of using this technology. As we know that pathogen in sewage is a se severe problem because bacteria or virus in sewage may cause waterborne diseases to human beings and uh, animals. And in our uh, sewage treatment process, we always use the E. coli bacteria as the indicator to show the performance or efficiency of this infection. Therefore, due to the, the, the harm of bacteria and virus to kill and to remove the pathogens from the sewage to comply with the discharge standard is necessary in order to prevent diseases caused by the bacteria or virus from spreading and safeguard human beings. Moreover, that the traditional disinfection process like uh, chlorination and UV disinfection are, are both efficient way but they still have some limitations, such as producing the toxic disinfection byproducts and uh, for UV disinfection, possible UV, possible uh, bacterial regrowth may happen. To tackle this problem and 
to achieve a more sustainable and a green process, we propose the photocatalytic disinfection process. By using this process for disinfection of real sewage, that the materials, the photocatalyst is, re is reusable. And uh, all of this process is driven by, by solar, solar energy. More important, in this process, no disinfection byproducts was, is produced. And among the uh, photocatalyst material, titanium dioxide is one of the most widely explored material because it has the advantage of uh, like uh, high activity, low cost and non-toxicity and the chemical stability. However, when using this photocatalyst titanium dioxide in treating real wastewater, there are still some limitations, such as the recombination of the electron and host during the process. And uh, this material is restricted uh, activity under UV light only. And after the treatment, they are difficult to be separated from the treated sewage water. To tackle these problems and to um, apply this technology in the real world, we further modified the photocatalyst. First, we make a magnetic core, iron oxide and silicon dioxide, and then put the modified titanium dioxide on this iron core as the shell. The method we improve this titanium dioxide is using iron and the nitrogen cold doping. By using this way, we can improve the visible light activity of titanium dioxide. Furthermore, to improve this uh, performance of the material, we use reduced graphene oxide, that the short form is RGO, on the outer layer of the whole material composite. Here is the composite structure of these uh, component using the short form uh, RGOFENTFS in the following presentation. This is a solar light driven magnetic photocatalyst. <clears throat> and after the first step of synthesis of the material, then we apply the technology and the material in the real sewage treatment. As we know that our target in this study is to is try to explore the potential and the possibility of, of, of using photocatalytic disinfection process to replace the traditional disinfection method. But as we know that there are different kinds of and a complex components in real sewage, such as the organic matters, suspended matters, and the ions, they will they are hindering the efficiency of the photocatalytic disinfection process. So the, the, first, the, the second part of this study is to study the effect of this component, how they interfere the disinfection process using, the, using this technology. And after the treatment, the sewage, the treated sewage will be discharged to the water body before that, we have to prove that our proposed technology is safe, safe to the environment and safe to the uh, animal. In so in, in this part of study, we choose natural born phytoplankton from seawater as the indicator of the toxicity of the material. Here is the setup of, of this study. Here is the simulated solar light generator. It will generate this, the light with the similar spectra of the real sunlight. And here the fan will keep the, the solution in a con consistent temperature during the reaction. And because this work, this work is facing the real world. So the equal density of the sewage sample before and after, uh, after the treatment process 
is our is our concern. And we the standard to to tell whether the whether the technology is feasible or not is to is to see by cheating the it is to see the cheated sewage can can meet the discharge standard or not. And in also in this study we we collect four different types of sewage in Hong Kong. The first one is the low salinity sewage after tertiary treatment. Then we label it as the sewage treatment, sewage treatment works one. And, and then the second one is the low salinity sewage after secondary biological treatment. And the third one is the high salinity sewage after secondary biological treatment. And the last one is the high salinity after the CEPT process. And this discharge standard we we use to to tell whether the technology has the potential to treat real so real sewage individually. <clears throat> and here come to the first part of the of the result part, the 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 development of the photocatalyst. Here we use the the TEM method to characterize the obtained photocatalyst. Here we, we show that as the different compounds can be seen in the T, TEM process, they are the RGO layer here and the, the magnetic core. And here is the shell and the component of titanium di dioxide. To further, in, to further prove the successful synthesis of this material, we use the TEM EDS process by mapping the to show the element mapping. Here we can clearly see the titanium, iron, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, and the silicon. Different, different elements can be shown in this mapping. <clears throat> and it shows that the successful synthesis and of this RGO FE NTFS photocatalyst. Then we use this material, then we use this photocatalyst in treating real wastewater. For the first wastewater, that which is the low salinity sewage after tertiary treatment, we can see that under the simulated solar light, again, after around 30 minutes to 20 minutes treatment, it can meet the discharge standard. Then we also make the duplicate process by, by using this photocatalyst in sewage sample collected in different times. <clears throat> to further prove the further prove the disinfection efficiency, we also perform, perform the life that assay. Here we can see that we use the, the stain, the DAPI and PI to stain the bacteria. Here we can see some, some blue, blue point here shows both the viable and the dead bacteria. And the, the red point shows the dead bacteria only. The method is that the DAPA stain can penetrate both the viable and the dead bacteria, so it can show the total bacteria cells. But for the PI, it can penetrate only the damaged cell membrane. So the red point shows only the damaged bacteria cell. Here we can see we can see that after disinfection, that the the red point. The amount of red point improved <clears throat> in and after the settlement of the sample in dark for 24 hours and and uh, 48 hours, no rebound of the blue sample and uh, the concentration and the density of the red point are, are stable, indicating that during this photocatalytic disinfection process. The cell wall, the, the cell structure of the bacteria were damaged. And after this damage, the, uh, 
and this damage are not reversible. The same, the same test were performed in the second type of sewage. That for the low salinity sewage after secondary treatment, that also promising result was obtained. After around six, 60 to 45 minutes, that the treated sewage can, can meet the discharge standard. And in the live death assay, we can also see that no rebound and no, no significant regrowth of the damaged bacteria can be seen after the 48 hours in, in dark. And for the <clears throat> and for the regrowth test, we further perform this this test for the inactivated bacteria because for the sewage the first type and the second type of sewage sample, then we get the promising result that we just keep it keep the disinfected or the treated sewage in dark after the after the reaction for 48 hours, we can see that the E. coli density was stable in both type of photo, uh, in both type of, of sewage sample. That it means that no bacteria will grow by using this technology in the treated sewage after 48 hours. But the situation gets worse in, in the following two types of sewage for the high salinity so linear sewage after secondary treatment, then we can see that it, it took 240 and 40 minutes to meet the discharge standard. And in, in one sewage sample collected in 2019, that even after, after 240 minutes, that the the treated sewage cannot meet the discharge standard. That the situation in the fourth type CEPD treatment sewage is, is not that promising as the previous three sewage sample, that the E. coli densities were stable after even four hours of treatment. Then we can say that in by using the photocatalytic disinfection process, it has the potential and show the prospect in using this technology in, in the first and the second type of sewage. Then after treating the sewage, the, su the, the sewage may be discharged to the water body. And then its safety is also our concern. And uh, the and uh, the water matrix can also interact with the in, with the radical produced in the photocatalytic disinfection process. Here we can see that we can compare the different characteristic of the sewage sample, like the pH. The pH and the DO may affect the generation of the reactive species, which may attack the bacteria. And for the organic compound, they may consume the reactive species. And it is the standard method. They can scatter the incident light to cut the light from, from the radiation of the photocatalyst. And finally, the ions. The ion may impact the surface charge of bacteria and the photocatalyst. So we further conduct the, the test to see the fluctuation of the um, sewage characteristic on the disinfection performance. Then we can see that the, if, if the fluctuation doesn't matter, then we use the tape. It means that the, even the water matrix Content fluctuate that the treated sewage can still meet the discharge standard. Otherwise, we use the cross. Then, by you by having this result, 
we can see we can say that the fluctuation of water characteristic is more tolerable for the sewage after tertiary treatment. And uh, this is the uh, first type of the sewage. And after the treatment, and as we say that the safety of this technology is also our concern. So for the uh, bioassay, we select the phytoplankton because they have they are highly productive in the in the coastal area and it has a high surface to volume ratio, can quickly respond to toxicity. Here also shows the area we collect the natural born phytoplankton in HKUST campus and uh, use them use this to, to count the viable phytoplankton. It shows that, that the black circle means that the phytoplankton are viable, otherwise they are dead. So by studying the impact of the photocatalyst on the phytoplankton, we can, in, we can indi indicate the safety of the, of the technology. We can, say, we can see that no significant adverse effect of the of the with the addition of the photocatalyst on phyto on phytoplankton. That it's it tells that the safety of the application of the of this photocatalyst when we use a dosage of lower than two gram per liter. One thing I would like to mention is that the dosage here is not the dosage we use in, in the treatment process because after treatment, a magnetic separation will, will be performed to remove up to 99.5% of, uh, of the photocatalyst. So, so the residual photocatalyst in the treated sewage is much, low, is much lower, even much lower than 0.005 gram per liter. Here, two gram per liter, we just show the extreme case that if the magnetic separation fail and all of the material in the sewage were discharged to the, to the uh, ocean. Here is the briefly conclusion is that for the first part of this study, we developed this type of uh, photocatalyst with the enhanced efficiency for photocatalytic disinfection for low salinity sewage. And for the first type and the second type of sewage, then it takes around 20 minutes or 45 minutes to, to meet the discharge standard under the uh, irradiation of simulated solar light. And also the water characteristic especially the TOC and turbidity and the DO are the crucial impacts for the practi practicality of this technology. And finally, by using the uh, bioassay with the phytoplankton as the toxicity indicator, we can see the safety of using this photocatalyst in the real wastewater. Uh, finally, I would like to thank the financial support from DSD and the, also we are also very grateful to Hong Kong IE and the Hong Kong IE transaction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. He. Let's move on to the question and answer section. We have 10 minutes to answer questions from the floor and from the online audience. For the online audience, if you have any questions, please put down your questions by using the Q&A feature on the screen. We will attend your questions shortly. May I first invite questions from the floor, please. Any, any questions?
And also any questions from the online audience? Okay, maybe let me start <laughs> asking some questions, okay? Yeah. Uh, Dr. He, your work is very interesting. Okay, and um, uh, I would like to know, okay, uh, uh, in your presentation, you, you mentioned the photo catalyst you developed is reusable. Yeah. How do you test the, uh, the usability of your mm -hmm. photo catalyst? Mm -hmm. Thank you. And for the test of the reusability, we follow this process. After the treatment, we will uh, separate the photocatalyst from the treated fluid by using the magnetic, mm -hmm. magnetic process. That after the magnetic separation, up to, uh, not, not, not up to, more than 90, 99.5% of the photocatalyst can be collected. Mm. Then we wash it using water, just, just wash one. Then uh, we, use, we use this photocatalyst directly mm. in the untreated sewage. Then by then use this photocatalyst cycle by cycle. And we found that the efficiency is, con is consistent up to five cycles. Then we by having this result, we say that the reusability is, is good and this photocatalyst can be, can be reusable. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's uh, see any questions from the floor or from the online audience again? Okay, may I ask one more question, <laughs> Dr. Ho. Okay, in, in your uh, study, you, you test the, the safety of your photocatalyst okay, by using phytoplankton. Mm. Uh, I, well, I, I read other, some other work. They, some other researcher may use uh, fish embryos, such mm -hmm. as zebrafish mm -hmm. or madaka fish. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, yeah. can, can, would it help me the, 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 the difference between mm -hmm. different tests? Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks for the question. Um, the phytoplankton and like the big head fish, uh, different type of the uh, toxicity indicator. The reason we select the phytoplankton is that because the phytoplankton is at the bottom, at the bottom position of the food web of the coastal area. So we think that uh, also according to reference that the, the change or the reaction of the phytoplankton can, can reflect the toxicity of the material in the ocean at the, at the first time. And even at the maybe uh, lower dosage. And of course, for the like the fish and the big head fish, the the impact is also can be can be seen. But it is possible that it requires a higher dosage of the toxin, and the, the phytoplankton may reflect that more sensitively. Okay, so, uh, since time is limited, we have to end mm -hmm. our Q and A sessions. Are uh, here. Uh, so let's uh, thanks Dr. He again. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. okay, may I now okay, proceed okay, to the presentations by the awardees of 2022. May I introduce our second awardee, Mr. Hong An Wong. Mr. Wong is currently an engineer in the highways department of the HKSAR government. He will present his award paper on design criteria for struck and tie modeling in Hong Kong practice. Let's welcome Mr. Wong. So uh, thank you, Professor Leung. Uh, I'm Tony Wong. So today I'm going to present 
um, a topic in the field of structural engineering, which is based on my research work during my study at the University of Hong Kong. So the topic of today is related to a uh, struct and time model or the STM, which is a method used for design of reinforced concrete structures. So here's the content of my sharing today. So after the introductions, I will uh, present to you some examples of the current STM proposal from some of the literatures and also existing design codes. And after that, I will also uh, present to you the rec our recommended STM design criteria, followed by design example of a candidate for the bid. So normally, uh, when we are designing reinforced concrete structures, so uh, we are often make use of the simple beam bending formula for design the beams like here. So this is the beam uh, that is long enough and is dominated by its bending behavior. However, when it comes to some special components like uh, the beams and also the cobbles, so the behavior is no longer governed by bending, instead they're governed by shear. So a struct and time model can be used to analyze these so-called the non threshold components. So a strut and time model comprise the compression concrete strut, the reinforcement tension time, and also the concrete load. So in STM, we have to track the stresses of each STM component against the corresponding strength capacity. And this is the example of the strut. So this equations, the FCE is the effective strength of concrete. So, which is taken as a fraction of the compressive similar strength of concrete. So this factor is known as the strut efficiency factor. And this factor may depend on some factors below. For example, we can have the strut geometry and the right size shows some of the examples of, of the strut. And we can, it can also depend on the concrete strength effect, the strut angle, and so the amount of lateral confinement. So for looks, normally they can be classified into three types, including the CCC, CCT, and the CTT looks, representing the number of tension ties connecting at a load. And similar to struct, it can, uh, we can also define a factor known as the load efficiency factors uh, to be the local strength, which can depend on the following factors. So for bearings, in fact, at the external phase of a load, we can also define a so-called the strength capacity for the so-called external phase of a load. And the bearing conditions can usually classify into three types, including the uh, dry bearing, the better bearing, and also the cast in steel plates conditions. So uh, one more thing is that uh, due to the no distribution effect here, so actually the bearing strength of concrete can actually be increased due to the confinement effect by the surrounding concrete. So in design course, normally we define a factor called, uh, called the confinement modification factor M here, taken as the square root relationship between the low distribution area and the low depth area. So uh, while it's a study of the STM, so in fact, uh, the current issue is that there is this inconsistent set of STM design criteria among different uh, literature and design codes. And what's more is that um, still at currently there's still a missing, a comprehensive STM design method in Hong Kong. And the relevant design code will include the structural concrete code and also the precast concrete codes issued by the buildings department. So uh, my study is by reviewing the existing literature and the design codes aims to unify the, uh, the STM design criteria for structs, locks, and bearings with localization so that it can be applied practically in Hong Kong. So now let me first begin by introducing to you some STM proposals from the mm -hmm. literature. So this table summarizes the struct efficiency factors from different uh, literatures. So you can see that there could be different uh, model types. So we can have the constant factor model here, which is, which is simple and easy to apply. So there are also models that depend on the concrete strength. And this, the structural efficiency factor can actually reduce with increasing concrete strength due to the concrete bitterness effect. And there are also models that depend on the structural angle or the strain, just like here, the, the theta here. So when the angle is small, 
the shot and also the tie are nearly in opposite direction, try to induce some strength incompatibility. So recently, there are also some research trying to incorporate the confinement effect in the equations right here. So uh, with the confinement effect, the strut efficiency factor can be greatly improved and it can be improved to a value of over one right here. So for looks, so this will be the table for the uh, look efficiency factors from some of the researchers. So nearly all researchers classify the look efficiency factors according to the type of looks. And, uh, uh, and the values decrease us from CCC to CC CTT logs, uh, similar to structs. So some of the models are also dependent on the concrete strength effect and also the concrete confinement effect. So lastly, this is for the uh, bearing strength. So in fact, unlike the struct and also the log, mm -hmm. the confinement effect Use the, that that is the factor M has been uh, very common in uh, design codes since Hopkins in 1968. And normally in design, we will make use of the ultimate strength <coughs> capacity with the effect of the confinement in design to avoid any a complete failure of the bearings. So now we we'll move on to the STM provisions in design codes. So in my studies, I have selected several international design codes. They include the Euro code, the model code, and the standard in Canada, America, and Australia. So in, in Hong Kong, although there's no detailed requirement on the STM requirement, the, the bearing strength requirement is also specified in the precast concrete code in Hong Kong, which can also be refilled together. So this table actually summarizes the calculated strut efficiency factors among uh, different design codes. So for comparison on the same basis, I have included the different strength reduction factors used in the design codes. This is in fact the reciprocal of the parcel safety factor for the concrete materials. So the effect of the parcel safety factor for the loadings is also included in this uh, so-called adjusted design value for the strut efficiency factors. So you can see that in general, the, uh, the strut efficiency factor decreases with increasing stress disturbances from left to right, such as from the 90 degree angle strut to the uh, shallow angle strut at 30 degree. So however, for Canadian standard, and also the Australian standard, which depends on the strut angle and also the strength, the design strut efficiency factor is rather small here. Uh, like so point two two as shallow angle struct at around 30 degree. So they are actually rather conservative compared to the arts. So for the first two rows, there are the European standards, including the Euro code and the modal code. In general, the, the struct efficiency factors also are more conservative. So uh, in the two recent American design codes, including the Astro LLFD and also the ACI code in the 2019 version, so it is found that the confinement effect M has been included. So this is the table summarizing the load efficiency factors among design codes. So uh, sim and the values actually decreases from the CCC load and to the CTT loads. So uh, similar to structs, the Euro code and the model code are more conservative than the other design codes. And then the confinement factor M is also found included in the two recent American design codes. So uh, lastly, for the bearing strength, actually uh, most codes classify uh, their bearing strength uh, by, by including the concrete confinement effect factor M ex explicitly, ex except the Hong Kong code. So uh, there's one more uh, coefficient here, the alpha here is known as the uncertainty factor just like the silicon FI here, which is a factor accounts for the long-term strength reduction effect of concrete under sustained loading. So you can see that in general, the blue values, blue highlighted values are quite consistent to, uh, with each other under low confinement effect. So the drug better bearing conditions used in the Hong Kong code can actually correspond to the uniform stress conditions. And in ESTO LRFD, there's also specified uh, strength reductions under long uniform stress conditions. 
which can uh, corresponds to the dry barium case in Hong Kong gold. So next, I'm going to go into the discussions uh, that may contribute to the variant design codes and also research models and recommend the appropriate STM design criteria. So uh, first of all, I would like to like, uh, talk about an issues about the geometric definition of locked uh, under hydrostatic and non-hydrostatic conditions. So here is the uh, hydrostatic loops. For hydrostatic loops, the stresses on each phase of a load uh, uh, should be equal. Uh, however, uh, the hydrostatic loop may have a it may not be appropriate at shallow shock angle due to the unrealistic uh, geometry of the load. You can see in this figure here, there could be the local depth here, that is this side, and also the stroke width here is uh, too long. That means they are too, uh, they are excessive. So the long hydrostatic load, which uh, only consider the forced equilibrium, can actually allow greater flexibility in sizing the load. Just like uh, here, that it can actually allow a step change in the load that makes the load, uh, local geometry more realistic. And that's why uh, the long hydrostatic load is actually more recommended. Uh, for hydro long hydrostatic nodes, some old researchers also point out that for the strength or stroke angle based models, they may be too uh, conservative at shallow stroke angles. Uh, for example, here it, it is the design stroke efficiency factor uh, 0.22 in the Canadian standards. So this factor here is rather small, that when it is applied to the realistic stroke width here, so the calculated force capacity may be too small, which is uh, too conservative. So a similar stroke angle based model is actually not uh, recommended. So uh, next, it is an issue about the depth of the compression zone, which refers to the CCC local depth here in this uh, deep beam case. So there are actually different types of definitions of this uh, local depth according to different research models. So it can be uh, referring to a uh, definition one, which is based on the conventional uh, factual analysis. So on the other extreme, definition two corresponds to the depth under the uh, derived from the elastic theory. And definition three is the depth based on the static equilibrium uh, of the STM system. So I have investigated the effects of the three definitions of the local depth on the structure efficiency factor uh, using the experimental results from Su and Noi. So in fact, Su and Noi have also uh, considered to use the definition free and also the long hydrostatic local conditions like here. And they propose a constant, a 0.7 uh, shock efficiency factor with consideration of different uh, uh, concrete strength and also the shear spent moment arm ratios. So uh, this figure actually uh, some, uh, is, my, is the structure efficiency factors that I've recalculated according to different definitions of the uh, local depth against the shear span of one arm ratios, which correspond to the decreasing structure angle theta here. So uh, the horizontal line here are actually the lower bound value uh, of, the, of all the data points of the structure efficiency factor are evaluated from each definitions. So uh, you can see that with increasing local depth from definition three to other definitions, the structure efficiency factor actually uh, reduced from my constant 0.7 value to uh, 0.4 here. So uh, in fact, definition three is actually uh, more preferable because uh, it corresponds to the most appropriate stress state of our STN. So therefore, uh, the structure efficiency factor of 0 0.7 or 0 0.6 after considering the 0.85 cons uh, uncertainty factor is actually more recommended. So for other factors like the 0 0.4 here, they're actually too small. So if we apply a uncertainty factor, 0 0.85, and then the, another parcel safety factor of 1.5, the value will become 0 point, uh, 0 0.2, just like the Canadian standard which is too small and too conservative. So here is a summary of the uh, local strength. 
uh, the above discussion are mostly for shock. And so this is a table for the load, load efficiency factor among different literature and design codes. So you can see that uh, in general, the typical values in the literature is around 1.4 to 1.5 times the typical values in design codes, which is consistent to the typical values of a uh, factor of safety. And the fat, highlight values are actually the recommended uh, design strength given the relatively high consistency of the typical values within each nodal type. So here, uh, for the proposed bearing strength, uh, 0.75 coefficient uh, with the effect of the concrete confinement effect, the factor M is uh, recommended for the better bearing conditions. And this graph here actually shows the normalized bearing strength against the uh, uh, confinement modification factor. So you can see that the proposed value 0.75 is actually a little bit smaller than the 0.85 values proposed in the uh, ACI code, because it is considered that the uh, ACI code may not be uh, conservative enough, enough, particularly at the high strain concrete at M near to the value of two. So you can see in, uh, in, in this orange line, which is uh, evaluated from Hopkins, using a high strain concrete of 60 MPA, the line actually can fall below the strength predictions by the ACI code. So for the proposed bearing strength, which is in the black line, it generally falls within the upper bound and the lower bound of the strength predictions by other research models, which is uh, more recommended. And the, uh, and the deficiency of the current Hong Kong code that means it is too conservative at this uh, uh, low confinement conditions can also be eliminated. So uh, this is the summary of the proposed SDM design strength uh, for each SDM component discussed before after taking into account of parcel safety factor of 1.5. So uh, in this table, constant efficiency factor is actually recommended for practical use and convenient use. And the benefit of the confinement factor M is also considered. Uh, for applications in Hong Kong, so I've converted the cylinder strength here into the concrete group strength by assuming a 0 0.8 relationship here. So uh, I've also uh, improved the consistency of the design codes. Uh, for example, for the better Better bearing, the bearing strength here, silicon 4 factor here, is actually made consistent with the CCT local strength here. And this is consistent with the typical scenario of having a member support, like here, where the load under consideration is a CCT load. And then another example is about the CCC local strength. The silicon 4 factor here has been made consistent with the maximum compre concrete compressive stress currently adopted in the Hong Kong concrete code. So now I'm going to uh, demonstrate to you a design example of a cantilever dipping based on the proposed design criteria. So uh, this is the configuration of the problem. So I've intentionally designed the bearing page to be smaller <coughs> to the member grid here to account for the confinement effect. So here is the STM used in the analysis. So based on static equilibrium and also the long hydrostatic load conditions, so all the local dimension and also the internal forces can be computed. And I have also computed the confinement factor at each support. For example, at look see here, the confinement factor that is actually greater than one because of the so small load area there. So uh, after that, uh, we can uh, check the strain capacity of each STM component accordingly. So here is the example of designing the steel reinforcement of the tension tight CD based on this uh, calcul calculated tension force. So uh, just one remark here is that in STM analysis, we have to ensure that the, there should be sufficient anchorage strain for the steel reinforcement within or behind the local region just like this uh, typical example here in this figure. So after that, for the struct and note, here is an example for checking the strength at lot C, uh, which is a CCT lot. 
The string thread shall be carried out at all local phases of a load, including the bearing phase, the back phase, and also the struct to load interface, which corresponds to the struct BC stresses. So and these terms here are actually the corresponding strain capacity. So you can see that with a confinement factor M here of 1.4 for log C, the strain capacity can be greatly improved so that a more economical design can be achieved. So uh, this is the reinforcement details uh, after checking all the local strength at uh, all these three nodes. So the two parts here are the uh, main tension time reinforcement and the other reinforcement are in, in fact the distributed reinforcement for uh, crack control. So uh, to summarize, uh, the unified design criteria for structs, locks and bearings have been proposed after having reviewed uh, from an array of literature and design codes. So uh, for practical use, constant efficiency factors are recommended, and these factors should be applied under uh, along hydrostatic load conditions and based on the static equilibrium of the STM system. So uh, to allow more economical design, a confinement modification factor of M is considered. So uh, lastly, I would like to uh, acknowledge and thank the co-author of this paper, engineer Dr. Wei Su, who is an associate professor in the Department of Civil Engineering at the University mm -hmm. of Hong Kong for his guidance and supervision throughout my studies. So uh, that's the end of my sharing today. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Mr. Wong. Now we have 10 minutes for questions and answer. For again, for the online audience, if you have any questions, please put down your questions by using the Q&A feature on the screen. We will attend your questions shortly. And now I would like to uh, check if we have any questions from the floor. Okay, please. I would like to have uh, two to three questions for Mr. Wong. Uh, first of all, uh, among the quotes you mentioned for international, uh, it seems you do not refer to Japanese uh, Is that right? Uh, yes. Why, right. Yeah. yeah I, so uh, in my study, I have selected several uh, design quotes. So uh, the aims of my study first is try to cover a wide range of code. That is, uh, I think I will consider it is uh, popular, widely adopted, and also cover a uh, rather large regions of uh, design code. So which I consider that the Euro code and also the American code, they are, I think they are widely adopted. So I've uh, selected uh, them. So that's why uh, this is, and then I also consider these design code have Cover sufficiently wide range of model types. They can, they, they, some of them can have the like a struck angle effect, and then some of them consider the concrete strength effect. So I think, and, and then at the, in the American code, it also consider the, uh, the type of strike, uh, the type of struck. So I've considered that the coverage of these codes are already enough. So uh, this is the reason why I selected these codes in my studies. So if the reason I ask is that because for Japan is a synaptic uh, country, so I suspect the code would be more stringent. So uh, do you think uh, um, among those codes that you refer to, which country has the stringent code in terms of that uh, efficiency factor? So uh, for the for I just mentioned in my uh, presentations, so I mentioned that there are actually two factors. One is the struck angle for the Canadian code and also the Australian code. They have included a struck angle effect. So I consider that when the shadow struck angle is uh, taking place, so they will actually uh, pose as quite a conservative result. And then for uh, European standards, uh, and that is the Euro code and also the model code. They actually based on the concrete strength effect, which is uh, based on a research model that is uh, done a rather long period 
of time of both. That's based on the paper by Nielsen et al. in around the 1970s. So for their paper, they consider concrete strength effect. And then with highest uh, concrete strength effect taking place, their, con their, 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 their efficiency factor can actually further reduce, which poses more conservatism to the, uh, to the uh, strong efficiency factor. So mm -hmm. I think these, uh, the new code and also the, uh, the Australian code and also the Canadian code that consider the strong angle, can actually are there more stringent yeah, among all design codes. And then the uh, last question maybe is, uh, if I understand correctly your presentation, the model group, the SDM, is more an engineering approach rather than a prescriptive design program. Yes. Yeah. So do you think this could be, uh, uh, could be put into use in Hong Kong uh, case? Uh, and if that has been put in, which infrastructure uh, building uh, has been adopting this uh, approach? So I think uh, uh, for my presentations, actually I am uh, proposing a model that's trying to incorporate uh, all effects and try that is uh, having a moderate conservatism compared to other design code. Uh, for my proposal model, I think it is uh, quite practical because um, I'm proposing a constant efficiency factors. This is unlike other design codes, like uh, the design code that may consider the short angle and also the concrete strength effect and also the type of uh, structure. Because I've con uh, I also consider when there are some, like uh, the American code, they specify the short efficiency factor according to the type of structure. I think uh, somehow it may make the things quite uh, complex because um, sometimes the engineers may, may find it difficult to judge uh, which type of structure should be used in their design. So, and also the strut angle here, the engineer may also find it difficult to, to use which, which angle should they use. So I think proposing a constant coefficient can actually bring convenience to the engineer uh, in, in practice, yeah. Okay, let, uh, let's move on to the questions from the online audience. We have three questions. Okay, let me read the first one. Is struct and tie model an ultimate limit state ULS design method or a serviceability limit state SLS design method? Okay, uh, thank you uh, for your questions. So uh, maybe let me talk more about the limit state design. So um, in the design of reinforced concrete structures, uh, normally, or no matter design of uh, structures, we are making use of the so-called limit state, limit state. So uh, we have the ultimate limit state, which, co which corresponds to the complete failure and also the collapse of our structure. And the serviceability limit state would refer to the scenario of like uh, affecting the function, like the the crack width and also the deflection of our structure. So uh, in fact, a STM a structure time model is an ultimate limit state design method, uh, which is based on the low bound plastic certificate. So that means the STM has to satisfy two criteria, oh, yeah. including the static equilibrium and also the yielding criteria. That means the concrete stresses and also the steel stresses in each STM component shall be within their corresponding uh, strength capacity. This is uh, what I have shown in the uh, design example. So um, for serviceability limit state, in fact, currently there has not been a well-established, I would say not a well-established SLS design method for the uh, STM. Oh, so because like uh, for STM, normally it is applied to a fake member. So for the defection, the SLS for defections, I would say it is not very dominant factor, not a critical factor for defections for a fake member. And for cracking in STM, uh, 
still no it is a common practice i would say uh in the design codes to specify a minimum uh, distributed enforcement and also I, I understand that there is also some research on the minimum uh, distributed enforcement for the uh concrete structure under stm design as well so therefore uh to follow the uh trend and also the common practice i think it is uh uh Good practice to specify a minimum distributed steel reinforcement, just what I demonstrated in the design example. So uh, by ensuring that the dis distributed reinforcement have been provided, so we can ensure that the SLS design could be uh, implicitly satisfied. So thank you. Okay, so uh, we have two more questions. Maybe Mr. Wang can give a very, uh, uh, well, a, a short, quick remark. The next question is, Second question, any reasons for picking those mentioned design codes in your study? Oh, okay, thank you. I think uh, this question is quite similar to the mm. question that I've been asked from the uh, audience in four. So uh, I've selected these codes because based on their, uh, their popularity, they are commonly adopted and also cover quite a lot of regions. And also uh, they, they have covered quite a lot of model types that uh, can be that I can carry out in my study. So I think, yeah, I think I hope I can answer the question. Okay. And then the last question, what are the improvements of the proposed STM design criteria compared with other design codes around the world? Okay, yeah, yeah. In fact, I've also uh, mentioned a bit about the improvement when I answer the questions from an uh, audience in four. That's uh, my proposed STM criteria is actually uh, more straightforward for applications by the engineers in Hong Kong, like because I have uh, specified a constant uh, coefficients. So another thing maybe I can point out is that actually I've uh, made uh, consistency among, in particular between the bearing strength and also the local strength, in particular the uh, bearing, uh, the bearing strength with the CCT local strength, because this is the typical scenario of having the member support like where the look under consideration is in fact a CCT look. In fact, in many design codes, I, I, I would say uh, there are different chapters for the for the uh, STM design strength and also the bearing strength. So there could be some inconsistency between the bearing strength and also the CCT local strength in other design codes. So it may be a problem when engineers encounter the STM design model that so they may hesitate which design strength should they use. So uh, making consistent between the design strength can actually improve the consistency in my uh, proposed uh, models. So uh, thank you. Okay, I think time, time is up. Okay, uh, thanks. Mr. Wang again. Now, let me introduce our third awardee, Ms. Chun Chen. Ms. Chen is now a PhD student of the Department of Building and Real Estate at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Ms. Chen is unable to join us physically at the Hong Kong IE headquarters, but she will present her award paper online. The title of her paper is Numerical Study of Electrochemical Thermal Cells for Harvesting low grade waste heat. Let's welcome Ms. Chen. So hello everyone. Today's topic is the numerical study of electrochemical thermal cells for harvesting low grade waste heat. Here is the outline of today's presentation. I will introduce my uh, work in the following orders. At first, I will show and introduce the brief background of low-grade waste heat to electricity conversion, and then I will show my work in modeling of thermal cells, including the uh, working principle, governing equations, model validation, parameter study, and conclusion. Let's begin with the background of low-grade waste heat to electricity conversion. A large amount of waste heat from industrial facilities and solar radiations 
is discarded into the environment without efficient utilization every year. And a large proportion of this waste heat is low-grade waste heat, which is below 150 degrees Celsius. This causes not only energy waste, but also the environmental unfriendly thermal pollution. So although efforts have been made to develop technologies for heat to electricity conversion in the last few decades, the energy conversion efficiency is still very low due to the kernel efficiency limitation. Generally, two main mature approaches, including the indirect and the direct methods, have been developed for low-grade waste heat harvesting. In indirect methods, the waste heat is converted into mechanical energy or other forms of energy at first, and then subsequently transformed into electrical energy. A typical case is the organic ranking cycle. In direct methods, so typical thermoelectric devices mainly rely on the heat induced electrons from semiconductor material when the two ends of the semiconductor materials are under two different temperatures. Additionally, there is another way. Thermoelectro, uh, thermochemical, uh, uh, electrochemical thermal cells. Electrochemical thermal cells appear to be more promising due to their low cost in comparison to TE devices. So here gives the brief, in, uh, brief introduction of a working principle of thermal cells. From this figure, you can see the working principle of thermal cells. So electrochemical thermal cells are based on the temperature induced voltage difference between the two electrodes of, of power generation. So as you can see from this figure, a thermal cell is composed of two electrodes separated by the electrolyte with redox couple of a certain concentration. So under a temperature difference, applied between the two electrons, a voltage is established due to the temperature response from the electro from the redox couples. As the redox, uh, as the oxidation reaction and the reduction reaction are the reversed reactions, so they share common reactants and products. When the oxidation and reduction reactions simultaneously occur at the two electrodes, theoretically the current generated without any changing in the total amount of any uh, total amount of substances. Therefore, if there is no degradation of the redox couples, a sustainable and stable current and voltage could be generated and delivered under a certain working condition. During the electricity generation process, a complete system involves highly coupled heat, trans heat transfer, mass transfer, and uh, electrode, electrochemical reaction processes. Despite of many experimental works, uh, there is no comprehensive the uh, theoretical or numerical study have been conducted on thermal cells to understand the effects of various uh, structural and operational parameters on their performance. So this work aims to develop a comprehensive mathematical model for thermal cells to guide its uh, design optimization by coupling the governing equations of heat, um, <clears throat> mass, and the charge transfer to describe the thermal cell system. So here display the, re uh, the governing equations of this model. Here I introduce the reactions, the uh, governing equations of electrochemistry, the governing equations of flow field and mass transport, as well as the heat transport and uh, how to, and at last how to calculate the efficiency. So this paper studied the effects of concentration of redox couple 
uh, temperature difference of the two electrodes and the size of electrodes thermal cells. Uh, so based on the uh, par parametric simulation, the optimal structural and uh, operational parameters are identified for uh, performance improvement. The governing equations were solved by using the finite element method. The model was developed in the console. So prelim a preliminary simulation was conducted for comparison with the experimental data uh, from the literature. So here shows the uh, experimental data and the validation data from our model. In the experimental, uh, in the experiment, the thermal cell works with the temperature difference of 86 Kelvin in the electrolyte of 0.9 molar of redox couple. Uh, also, figure A shows the results of grid independence analysis and also the uh, the analysis of degree of uh, freedom. So here, since uh, as the degree as the de degrees of freedom increases, you could say that as the peak power density gradually stabilized. So here we picked up uh, around, uh, so here we choose 50,000 degree of freedom to establish our model. So, so far we have choose the uh, degree of freedoms and uh, uh, to validate our model. And uh, from the validation data, we could tell that the cell the cell, uh, the model will, uh, we could tell that there is a great agreement between the simulation result and the experimental data. So here comes the first parameter study. Uh, at first, we evaluate the performance of our model. So by coupling the government governing equations, a comprehensive model was developed to describe the thermal cell system to be consistent with the working condition in the literature. The internal temperature difference and the concentration was said to be uh, 64 Kelvin and 0 0.9 molar uh, molar of dust couple respectively. So here you could see you could you can see the temperature gradients inside of the thermal cell. So as shown in figure A, the peak power density appears at approximately half of the OCV. Uh, figure B shows the temperature distribution in the electrolyte. According to the electrode kinetics, the temperature dependent rate constant at the low temperature electrode is lower than that of the higher temperature electrodes. Thus, the theoretical exchange current density at the low temperature electrode is lower than that at higher temperature electrode. So to sum up, the peak, the peak current density approaches the limiting current density of cathode before than that of the anode. And the resultant activation of a potential of cathode overwhelms that of the anode under the same current density. Despite the reaction rate difference, the ion diffusion process is also restricted by the relatively low uh, diffusion coefficient uh, of anode than uh, of cathode than the anode. In other words, the products generate generated at the cathodes are less likely to diffuse and easily restricted by the mass transfer. So uh, in one word, the power density is restricted by the cold electrode. Figure D shows the flow in a clockwise direction inside the cell under the influence of gravity. It is quite easy to understand that the fluid flow is driven by the uh, natural convection due to the lower density of the electrode at a higher temperature end. So the natural con convection helps to accelerate the mass transfer and heat transfer, and then eliminate the uh, concentration over potential caused by the accumulation of products on the electrode surface. So figure E and F profiles the 
ion distribution in the electrolyte. Since the flow velocity of the electrolyte at the corner is almost a zero. So here, the velocity of the corner is almost a zero. So the products gathers in the corner of the battery in the direction of uh, electrode flow and further affects the local potential and current density. So you can see that the current density of the corner is much uh, lower than the other places. According to the experimental results, the thermal conductivity hardly changes with the concentration, but the conductivity of solution rises sharply as the concentration increases. So we pick concentration as the second parameter, uh, parameter in our parameter study. So uh, since the, cons the conductivity increases with the concentration, uh, therefore the conductivity coefficient was firstly adjusted according to the concentration of electrolyte based on the experimental results. The effect of concentration on the performance of thermal cells as shown in the figure A, uh, it shows the power density as a function of concentration and working voltage. So uh, you could see that the maximum mean power density is improved significantly by increasing the concentration of redox couple due to the uh, great, uh, greatly improved current density. It is quite reasonable to, pre to predict the ascendant current density with increased uh, concentration based on the based on the concentration dependent kinetics. Um, also, assuming that the thermal conductivity and heat capacity are independent of the uh, electrolyte concentration, the Consultant input heat flux densities at different concentrations are almost the same, right? Thus, the relatively the relative efficiency increases. At the same time, the high concentration results in a greater exchange current density, which increases the activation of the potential under the same working current density. Um, this effect can be seen in the figure C. The model and the parameters were tested out with experimental data. Under the same working condition, the calculated power density. Um, under the same working condition, the calculated power density uh, matches the trend of reported experimental value. So you could see that uh, here dash line is the experimental value, and here is the our um, data from our model. This is because the uh, effect, uh, however, there is a little bit gap between our, between the, the data from our model, between, between our data in our model and the experimental data. This is because the effect um, of temperature on ele electrolyte conductivity is not considered in this model. Um, so to improve the accuracy of the simulation, the temperature effect on the conductivity was considered what uh, was considered and the additional simulation was conducted. So the updated modeling results agrees. Uh, here is the update updated modeling results agrees very well with the experimental data as shown in the figure D. Uh, so this data is the before before calculate uh, before calibrated and here is the uh, experimental data and here the the data between the two lines are the updated model data. And the second parameter study is the temperature difference parameter. Since the OCV results from the temperature coefficient, uh, there is very, uh, it is very evident to see that the OCV could be increased because the OCV is the product of temperature difference and the uh, temperature coefficient. So as a large temperature difference cannot only increase the 
large OCV, but also increase the, the power density, as well as the increase in the kernel efficiency. So here, uh, a large temperature difference can not only increase the uh, large OCV, but also increase the power density, uh, as well as the relative efficiency. So a uh, larger temperature difference could be beneficial to the performance of thermal cells. The next parameter is the thermal cell arrangement and the electrical surface. Um, since it has been proved that the thermal of uh, the power density reaches the maximum value when the length and uh, the width are equal, so a square shape of thermal cells uh, was used to study the arrangement effect. So from figure A, it can be easily found that the power density is higher when the electrode is placed ver ver vertically than, than that's when placed horizontally. This is because the natural convection caused by the density differences greatly affects the mass transfer process on the cathode surface. So from figure B and C, uh, it can also be seen that the electrode, when the electrode are placed in, in horizontally, the temperature gradients reaches, uh, becomes larger than when the cell arranged in uh, vertically. And so when the cells are placed uh, vertically, the temperature gradients on the surface of the cathode is larger. That will lead to a stronger convection. When the summer cell is, uh, as we talked before, the summer cell is limited by the uh, uh, electrode kinetics of the cathode. So vertical placement is indeed better than the horizontal placement. Also, by fixing the electrode placement and the average electrode distance between the two electrodes, as, uh, as shown in the, from figure D to figure E, the distance is uh, uh, 1.3 millimeter. The electrode is designed to have a ribbed structure with even spaces. The essence of this is to investigate the electrode area influence on current density and power density. So as a result, the ribbed cathode works under a current density of uh, around 200 ampere per meter square and power density of around 11.7 uh, water per meter square, which is slightly higher than those of plate electrode. The finding lends the support to our assumption that the power density is hindered by the relatively low kinetics of the cold electrode. So consequently, enlarging the cathode area uh, in our research is the cold electrode. It's more efficient than turning the, than improving the anode. The power density in figure E to G are predictable higher than those, are also predi predictable higher than those a plate electrode with a distance of 1.3 millimeter. However, the power density stabilized at approximately 11.5 water per meter square rather than increased with the cathode area. When exclusively talking the cathode area into consideration, the results seem inconsistent with our hypothesis. This can be explained by the current density distribution in figure E. 2G, uh, from which the high current density occurs at the cathode surface closest to the high to the uh, heat source and diminish very quickly at the channel depth exceeding one millimeter due to the low mass transfer. These findings allow the inference that from the perspective of electrode design, a larger power density is dominated by the closest distance between the anode and the cathode, as well as the area of 
uh, cathode near the distance. So a rational design of bilateral, bi bilaterally waved electron structure in figure I satisfying these suggestions given above uh, exhibits uh, an average power density of around 13.5 water per meter square. So if the mass transfer problem at the end corner, here's the end corner of the cell can be solved by circulating the electro electrolytes. So if we're using the flowing electrolytes, it could be uh, further improved. So this design is worth trying for, for the purpose of promoting the power density. And this value can even be further increased by replacing the solid electrolytes with a foam metal uh, electrode or the purple or the porous the carbon electrodes, as well as by applying the flowing electrolyte. Here comes the conclusion of, uh, of this presentation of this work. Uh, this work investigates the effects of operational and stru uh, structural parameters on the performance of thermal cells using a mathematical model. It is, it is found that the performance of thermal cell is restricted by the slow electrochemical electrode kinetics and the mass transfer process of cold electrode. So as kinetic and mass transfer process uh, are related to the temperature and concentration, Increasing the concentration of redox couple and widening the op operating win temperature window to enlarge the temperature difference of the two electrodes are beneficial to the peak power density and efficiency. In a thermal cell design, a vertical placement of electrodes demonstrate a 30.85% higher power density than the horizontal placement of the electrodes appropriately and also appropriately increasing the area of the cathode which is closest to the anode such as by using the porous electrode or designing the electrode morphology helps to enlarge the power density therefore a rational design of bilaterally ribbed electrode uh, uh, ribbed electrode structure produce a higher power density it is also found that the temperature distribution near the cathode greatly affects the cathode reaction. By uh, applying the porous, applying a porous separator with a lower thermal conductivity to enlarge the temperature gradient on the cathode surface could enhance the convective mass uh, transfer process, thereby increasing the power density. The further improvement of thermal cells requires the redox couple with a higher temperature coefficient, electrolytes with lower thermal conductivity and higher conductivity, as well as the electrodes with faster kinetics to maximize the power density and the efficiency. They are all the necessary requirements for practical application of thermal cells. And here is all of, uh, the, present, the, all of the contents of today's presentation. Oh. Now we have 10 minutes for questions and answer. Uh, again, okay, for the online audience, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function to type your questions. Okay, first, uh, any questions from the floor? Please. I just need to note on uh, this one. Oh, no, Miss Chang, sorry. Uh, the application of this technology in harvesting the waste heat in Hong Kong, because there are so many waste heat from, uh, from different kinds of uh, situations, such as the, the chimney flue, the heat rejection from the air conditioner, etc. How possible this uh, could be used for commercial application or res residential application? Ms. Chen, had, uh, Hello? The, the, have you, have, have uh, you heard the questions? Uh, the, the sound is not very Okay, the, clear. the question is, the question is, or can you practically 
apply to your thermal cells, okay, to recover waste heat, okay, uh, from uh, in Hong Kong. Yeah. In Hong Kong, from Hong the industry. Kong, in Hong Kong, basically, not so many waste heat by the uh, nuclear power station, uh, by factory, that kind of, but in Hong Kong, yes. The way it exists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I believe, I believe the uh, demonstration is uh, could could be applicable in Hong Kong's uh, in, in in the Hong Kong society because the uh, the proof the proof in concept demonstration have been have been successful uh, successfully achieved in that. So uh, under uh, forty degrees Celsius. Uh, Temperature difference, they, it, it could it could provide uh, around ten water per meter squares of power density. So, I think in the future. Okay. Yes. Right, yeah. Thank you. Um, let's see any questions from the floor and from the online audience. Okay, Miss Chen, I have a question. Okay, your um, I, I would like to know more about the fluid dynamics of your systems. What is the Reynolds numbers okay, of your uh, fluid flow? Uh, actually, we we didn't calculate the the, the number of of my flow because because the flow is very slow. The 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 number actually I didn't. Remember, it's very okay. clear of the number. So, so, so let me rephrase my question. Is this laminar flow or turbulence flow? Oh, it's the laminar flow. Okay, so so it is really slow <laughs> moving. Yeah, it's very slow. Okay, then um, uh, I would like to also know, okay, if, uh, if I want to optimize the design of the thermal cell, okay, what are the major parameters okay, I should modify? Mm, that is the temperature difference between the two electrodes. But that's the input. <laughs> that's yeah. the input from the uh, external environment. What, what about the, the, the cell design? Oh, the cell design. You mean, you mean the... Uh, maybe the electrochemical properties of the electrolyte or, or the thermal properties of the electrolyte or, or as you said, the geometry yeah, yeah, yeah. of the cell? Uh, I think there are the, the two major parameters uh, that affects the uh, performance uh, a lot. The first one is the electrochemical uh, parameters with uh, the, the the most important one is the change current density. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, relative to the natural of uh, nature, natural of the couple, the redox couple. And the second one is the is the distance between the two two Q electrode. The less distance is better. Okay. Okay. So. Thank you. And let me check again. Any more questions from the floor, from the online audience? Okay, maybe I'm, I have a final question. Okay. If you commercialize your thermal cell technology, is it going to be cost effective? Yeah, compared with the uh, most common uh, heat to, heat to uh, electricity devices which uh, for the low grade harvesting i think our devices is cost effective because it is very cheap compared with the um, te devices okay okay now uh, uh, perhaps we should end our q and a session here okay uh, again thank you uh, miss chen for your presentation Okay, now, last but not the least, uh, let me introduce our fourth awardee of today's lecture, Dr. Xiang Xuan Dan.
Dr. Dan is currently working as a consultant under the Smart Manufacturing Division in the Hong Kong Productivity Council. Dr. Dan is unable to join us today. However, she has pre-recorded her presentation on her award paper. The title of her paper is Critical Study on the Extraction of Collagen from Eggshell Membrane by Enzymatic Hydrolysis Reaction. Okay, now we play the video we, and, and hope you enjoy it. Hello everyone, I'm Deng Xiangxuan Coco. I'm currently worked as a consultant of Smart Manufacturing Division at Hong Kong Productivity Council. We appreciate the opportunity to receive an invitation to share our work here. The topic of today's presentation is critical study on the extraction of collagen from axial membrane by a somatic hydrolysis reaction. Here is the outline of this presentation. Firstly, we will give a brief introduction about this study, which including the background, the objective, and the reason why we choose this topic. Then I will talk about the experimental method and material used in this study. Also, the result and discussion on different critical parameters will be mentioned. The conclusion and the reference will be shown at the end. Eggs are easy to prepare and digest. They are considered a staple and a great source of complete protein, vitamins, and minerals. In addition, scientific evidence proves that eggs are a preventive food for chronic and infectious diseases. With the growth of the population and the development of the food processing industry, the use of eggs and their products has increased uh, significantly worldwide. According to some research study, in the past 30 years, egg production in Asia has increased dramatically by more than 115%. Although increased egg consumption has led to improve our quality of life, the apparent side effects of increased eggshell numbers and the resulting environmental concerns have received a greater uh, attention. Eggshells represent about 11% to 15% of the egg weight, and eggshells are the main waste in the processing of egg products, such as liquid egg and boiled egg. An eggshell comprised to two parts, the outer shell and the eggshell membrane. The outer shell is composed of around 90% eggshell chem cell. The main component of eggshell is chem cell carbonate. Due to the presence of trans minerals, such as magnesium, iron, and zinc, eggshell chem cell is supposed to be one of the most favorable natural chem cell sources to produce healthy, absorbable, and balanced calcium for the healthcare industry. The eggshell membrane located between the egg white and the outer shell. It is another valuable eggshell component that contains collagen, elastin, hyaluronic acid, and some amino acids. Collagen accounting for 10% of the eggshell membrane, and it is an important type of protein, which represents as fibers in human body used to connect and support bodily tissues, such as skin, bones, muscles, and other internal organs. It is widely used in medicine, biochemical, food, and cosmetic industries. The eggshell membrane can be obtained from the eggshell in many ways, such as microwave treatment, acid reductant reaction, dissolved air flotation. However, there are some difficulty among all these processes. For example, 
the existing process is complicated and the sewage treatment is required. Therefore, in this study, we will propose a new method to obtain eggshell membrane and extract collagen from it. Here are the experimental methods to extract collagen from eggshell membrane. The raw material eggshell waste was obtained from our partner, Lintai Hong Kong Fresh Liquid Egg Limited. This company has a history of more than 60 years, and they are in the business of fresh egg products. In this study, all raw material was obtained from our partner. Firstly, eggs were washed with water before being separated into egg white, egg yolk, and eggshell with an egg-breaking machine. The collected eggshell waste is then ground in a centrifugal mill to particles with a diameter of 2 to 5 millimeters. The second step is to separate the auto shear and the egg shear membrane. In this study, an acid reduction reaction was used. The eggshell waste collected from the centrifugal mill was washed with DI water to remove the remaining egg liquid. And then, 10 grams of eggshell was mixed with one more per liter acetic acid. The solution was steered at 160 revolutions per minute until free of bubbles. Once the eggshell was completely dissolved, its membrane was collected as a filter residue. The main component of the filtrate is calcium acetate, which can be used to prepare organic calcium, such as calcium lactate and calcium citrate. This organic calcium can be used as raw materials for healthy products and medicines. This direction will be studied by our partner for the next step. The third step is to extract collagen from the axial membrane through the enzymatic hydrolysis process. The filter residue axial membrane was soaked in one mole per liter acetic acid. In this study, pen pepsin and trypsin were used as biocatalysts for collagen extraction. The optimal reaction pH values of this free enzyme will 6.8, 2.6, and 8.5 respectively. We need to adjust the pH value of the solution first, and then a completely randomized design was used to study the effect of these critical parameters, such as enzyme type enzyme to membrane ratio and material to water ratio on the extraction rate of axial membranes. The complete randomized design is shown in Table 1. After the extraction by the enzymatic hydrolysis process, we would like to analyze the collagen extraction rate. Hydroxide proline and hydroxylase are the most two common amino acids in collagen, and they are not found in other proteins. Therefore, collagen concentration can be calculated by measuring the concentration of hydroxide proline. Therefore, after extraction collagen from axial membrane, the solution was hydrolysis by protease and then the indicator was added. Hydroxide proline solution is prepared by heating hydrolysis, activated carbon absorption and centrifugal separation. Also, we need to prepare for the black solution and the standard solution for the next step. To determine the hydroxide proline concentration, the UV VRS spectrum photometric method was used. This method is based on the oxidation reaction between hydroxide proline and chronomity. 
since the oxidation product can react with dimethyl amino benzaldehyde to form a fusion compound with the characteristic absorption peak and 550 nanometer, the concentration of hydroxide proline can be determined by measuring the peak intensity by UV via its spectral photometry. The intensity of color was measured in a one centimeter glass at a wavelength of 550 nanometer. The concentration of hydroxide proline is defined by the first equation. Well, a testing, a blank, and a standard are the absorbance of the sample, the black solution, and the standard solution, respectively. The C standard is the concentration of the standard solution, and the W standard and W testing are the volume of the standard solution and the testing solution. To calculate the collagen extraction, we can use the second formula. In this formula, the key is the hydroxide proline conversion factor, and it is 30.4 in this study. The M memory is the memory weight, and weight total is the total volume of the solution. Then we go to the result and discussion part. Different enzymes such as pepin, pepsin, and trypsin were used in the extraction process to evaluate the effect of enzyme type on the collagen extraction rate of axial membranes. Since the activity of biology enzymes is highly dependent on the hydrogen ion concentration, the pH volume needs to be adjusted before the extraction process. It was found that the optimal pH volume of pepin, pepsin, and trypsin were 6.8, 2.5, and 8.5, respectively. The enzyme to membrane ratio and material to membrane ratio were set to 0 0.5 and 1 to 100. The results are shown in Table 2. We can find the pepsin extraction rate of the two group were 1.7% and 1.69%, which is much higher than that of pepin and trypsin. Compared to the use of pepin, trypsin obtained more collagen, but three times less than pepsin. Therefore, pepsin shows better performance in the collagen extraction process. The second critical parameter is the enzyme to memory ratio. The results are shown in the screen. Based on the result of enzyme type, the pepsin with the beta performance was used in the following experiments. The extraction process was carried out using different enzyme to membrane ratios, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and 1. The material to water ratio was set at a 1 to 100. As shown in figure, with this ratio increasing, the substrate hydrolysis reaction becomes more complete. The collagen extraction rate significantly improved from 0.95% to 1.69%, with the ratio increasing from 0.25 to 0.5. By increasing the ratio to 1, the collagen extraction rate increased slightly to 2.81%, and the growth rate gradually decreased. The reason for this phenomenon is that if a large amount of enzyme is added to the reaction chamber, the exist enzyme may coagulate, thereby reducing the extraction rate and uh, inhibiting the hydrolysis reaction. Therefore, the optimal enzyme to memory ratio is one for producing collagen. The third critical parameter is the material to water ratio. The influence of this ratio of extraction rate might be caused by the low collagen solubility. 
in the extraction, the enzyme reacts with collagen to remove the non-helical ends of the collagen for increasing its solubility. This results in specified cleavage of the telopeptide reagent of the actual membrane collagen, which dissolves the collagen and allows it to diffuse out of the material. The material to water ratio was set to 1 to 100, 1 to 200, and 1 to 300 in this experiment. For the MI2 membrane ratio, although the optimal ratio is 1, the process cost will increase with the MI2 membrane ratio, which is not agree with our partner. Therefore, it will be set as 0 0.5 in the future experiment. As shown in Table 4, when the material to water ratio change from 1 to 100 to 1 to 200, the collagen extraction rate increased from 1.69% to 2.44%. However, when the ratio reached 300, the collagen extraction rate decreased to 1.96%. The reason for this phenomenon is that the hydrolysis reaction in the high concentration system is incomplete, and the higher concentration collagen hinders the extraction process. Both the degree of hydrolysis reaction and the collagen extraction rate increase with the decrease of concentration. However, the membrane and enzyme uh, concentrations are diluted with adding excess water, further resulting in a decrease in the collagen extraction. Therefore, the material to water ratio of 1 to 200 is favorable in the collagen extraction process. Here is the conclusion part. This study shows that there are three critical parameters can affect the performance of collagen extraction process. Pepsin should a higher extraction rate than pepin and trepsin during the collagen extraction. A material to water ratio of 1 to 200 was favorable in the collagen extraction process together with the pepsin to membrane ratio of 0 0.5. This parameter was found to be optimal for collagen extraction from the axial membrane, giving an extraction rate of 2.44%. The efficiency extraction condition identified in this study suggests the axial membrane waste could be one of the potential sources to obtain the collagen. Here is the reference about this presentation. This is all of our presentation. Unfortunately, we couldn't be there. Please email us if there are any suggestions and questions. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Dan. All the award papers have been presented. I would like to thank the awardees who have so generously offered their time and effort to prepare their presentation and help make this lecture such a rewarding one for all of us. All the award papers presented today have been published in the December issue of the Hong Kong IE transactions in 2021 and 2022. The award papers are available on the HKIE Transactions website. The Hong Kong IE Outstanding Paper Award for Young Engineers and Researchers 2023 is now inviting paper submissions. And the submission deadline is the 6th of March in 2023. If you would like to share your research accomplishments, please do not miss this opportunity and submit your paper to the award. 
the details and the application forms for the award are available on the HKIE website. The public lecture has now come to the end. Thank you. Goodbye.